Information on this video was based on NEATS modules number one. A PDF link for it has been included at the bottom within the video description. Magnetism is a property that some elements have to be able to attract iron. When we talk about this topic, we're going to talk about something called ferromagnetic materials. They are like steel, iron, cobalt, and they are others. And they can easily be magnetized. These ferromagnetic materials, they have some properties that are called reluctance, permeability, and retentivity. Reluctance is the opposition that a material offers to get magnetized. Permeability is the opposite of reluctance. If we say that a piece of material is very permeable, what we're saying is that it's very easy for it to accept magnetism. If we have a piece of metal and we try to magnetize it and it melts, but if it's very difficult, then we say that the material has a high reluctance. However, once we accomplish that, the high re reluctance material will retain great amount of magnetism. So, materials that have high reluctance, they will have high retentivity. Retentivity is the ability for a material to maintain magnetism after it's being magnetized. If the magnetization is very easy to do on a piece of metal, then we say that it has a very high permeability because it was very easy to magnetize. But as soon as we remove what is making it magnetize, then the high permeable piece of metal will lose its magnetism. To explain how magnets work inside at the molecular level, well, there are two theories. One is the Weber's theory, and what they're saying is that the molecules of the, that make the metal inside, when you get them to align facing them in the same direction, the piece of metal becomes magnetized. But that's not the only theory. The quantum physics, they say that it is not the molecules, but it's the electrons, or rather the atoms that are at the center that make the metal. The atoms, well, they do have electrons. And if you make them, all the electrons to spin in the same direction, kind of like in the solar system, the planets to spin in the same direction as they are going, traveling around the sun. So if you get electrons to travel in the same direction within that piece of metal, then you will get a high magnetic property or a very strong magnet from that piece of metal. So those are the two theories. One is called the domain theory, which is the one of electrons spinning at the same direction. And the other one, which it talks about the molecules being aligned, is the Weber's theory of magnetism. Magnetism and electricity are closely related. As electrons flow through a piece of wire, they do create a magnetic field around the copper wire. If you say, if you take the same piece of wire and now you coil it, like I done over here, and you put electrons, electrons flow from negative to positive, as we saw earlier. As soon as electrons start flowing, a magnetic field starts building up. And quickly, we have what is called an electromagnet. To make the electromagnet stronger, we put a piece of metal in the center of it, preferably 
a highly permeable piece of metal. And what it will do is that it will intensify the magnetic field that surrounds that new electromagnet. All magnets, whether it be normal magnets or electromagnets, they have what is called poles. So it would be the north and the south. And then there is these lines of flux that they always will travel from north into the south. There is a term called flux density. And it is the amount of actual lines of flux or individual lines of flux that leave the north to go into the south. The greater the number of flux, the stronger the magnet will be. On the other hand, if we take a magnet and we move it really fast through those copper turns, we will actually create current flow within the coil. The catch is that the movement has to be constant. So the piece of magnet has to be moving relative to the lines of copper and we will always have a current flow within the conductor. And that's why I say that magnets and electricity, well, they are very, they have a very special relationship. And somebody, if I take a magnet and I move it fast through a conductor, it creates current flow. But moving electrons, which is current flow, through a conductor, they create a magnet. Using the electromagnetic principle, we can generate electricity. But there are actually five ways to generate electricity. Pressure, chemical, electromagnetic, heat, and light. Let's take a look at each one of them. There are some quartz crystals that when you pressure them, they do generate small electrical DC voltages and they are used on microphones so that when the voice it comes down and actually pressures with a piezoelectric effect uh, pressures on the crystal, the crystal vibrates and generates a voltage. Very small, it needs to be amplified, but it is very useful to capture the voice of people. Chemical refers to batteries and different chemicals are arranged in a way that one side will have excessive electrons, the other one will have a depletion of electrons and when you put a load across the uh, terminal poles of the battery, electrons will flow from the negative pole to the positive pole until they get back to the equilibrium. Here we got an example of batteries but you already know what batteries is, so I'm going to continue to the next one. Electromagnetism is the most common way to generate large amounts of power for the use on board ships and even on cities. The power that we create from this is mostly AC, but our next video will go over the difference between DC and AC. Uh, the three elements that is required to create power via electromagnetic way it is a conductor, a magnet, and relative motion between those two. All uh, generators, uh, Hoover dams, and even windmills, they work on this principle because they just drive a generator. Heat works on the principle that when you take two dissimilar metal rods and if you fuse them, when you put heat on the fuse area, electrons will flow from one bar to the other one. And here we got electrons flowing from iron to copper. And this is how most of the uh, thermometers, digital thermometers, uh, work on board the ship using this principle. Like the one that I got here, an example, this is the one that you will be using to uh, check the uh, DFA fryer temperature. 
Our final one is light, and this one we just use a photovoltaic cell to capture the photons and convert it into power. This is mostly used for solar power. And here I got a solar power farm, and now you know that the five different ways to generate electrical voltage.